you, Edith. Thank you, Alex. Um, and we have a little consent for recording thing there to click. Um, so uh, welcome. Thank you very much for joining us today. Um, the topic is uh, being prepared for emergencies. And actually, there's so many dimensions to it. Um, it's um, going to be a talk of, say, 40 minutes or so. And then there'll be time for questions, perhaps in the middle, and time for questions at the end. Um, since we're a small group, we might allow ourselves to actually have a discussion on the audio. Uh, we'll see how that works out. But I would suggest also that you might want to have a paper and pen handy in case, because um, there's going to be a lot of information flowing at you quickly. And if there's something you'd like to ask about later or you want to look up later, um, you can write it down quickly or you can at any time type things into the chat box. Alex, our host, is going to be watching the chat box and feeding me questions at different times. Uh, and I'd like to assure you that any questions that we can answer today, we will get the answers and we will get them out later. There's also going to be a package of documentation that comes out to you afterwards. So um, it, it might be a good idea if you're not sure whether we have your email address to type an email address into the chat box now. And uh, that way you'll be sure to be on the mailing list for whatever comes after this. Okay. So I'm going to be sharing my screen and I'm going to be showing you some videos and some slides and, and uh, without further ado, I'm going to try and dive right in here. I have to do a share screen thing over here. And if I do this correctly, you will all see a coffee cup. Okay. <clears throat> so um, I will say right off the bat that um, I've collected a lot of this information and with Edith's help, I might add, from um, Emergency Preparedness Canada and from the Quebec government. And there's a lot of other sources. So you will see some of the materials come from the government. Um, and we sent you out an email. The email said uh, there are three parts to this talk. Um, first of all, understanding what the risks are that you might want to be prepared for. And secondly, um, making a plan for handling an emergency. And third, getting the kit necessary. So the talk's going to break roughly into those three pieces. Um, <clears throat> and I also mentioned a lot of people don't think that disasters are ever going to happen to them. So um, let's see if I do this properly here. Um, let's see, push that button there. Wait, why am I not? Uh, I am screen sharing, but I am not seeing. The slide is not moving. Oh, wait. There we go. Oh, I gave it away already. Okay, push the wrong button. So um, I'd like to start by playing you a little piece of video, if it will play for us here. Let's see what's going to happen. This should bring back memories. George, we're not getting the sound. Oh, okay. Um, what do I have to do? Uh, back down to in your share screen options, share audio, uh, video, sound. Uh -huh. Background. And I would have to go to oh, share sound. Thank you, Alex. <laughs> okay, there was just music on this, anyways, except for right here. Let's try again. Can you hear it now? There's a sound I remember. So yeah, 
people might say there's no disasters on my street, but um, most of us here in the room remember that one. Um, it affected also Ottawa and Kingston and parts of New Brunswick. Half of all Quebecers lost power. I lost power for a week. I knew a lot of people who lost it for two, some for three. The damage, you'll, see, you'll hear different figures, but the official Canada government uh, figure is four and a half billion dollars worth of damage. Um, we could have a discussion about this, but I can tell you what I lived with. No heat for a week except a fireplace. So I hung a curtain over the staircase from the basement rec room upstairs, managed to keep the rec room at about 18 degrees with the, with the fire. Rest of the house was at plus two after a couple of days. No laundry, no stove, all the food in the freezer and the fridge went bad. Um, you will remember that there were certain things that you couldn't buy. Uh, I thought about buying a generator, but couldn't get it. Uh, some of the roads and bridges closed. Some of the gas stations were closed. At one point, they weren't shipping any gas. I had major roof leaks and had to have a new roof done um, after the ice storm. And uh, there were no, no school for three weeks, uh, so the kids were at home. Fortunately, um, because I was teaching at Dawson College at the time, I also didn't have school, so I was able to be home too. Um, so here's a Canada government slide that uh, basically asks the questions, have you ever thought about things that you would have to do? Look after yourself if you live by yourself or look after your family for 72 hours. Why 72 hours? Because that's a standard, a government standard internationally and across Canada for how long the governments will need to get their resources into position when there's an emergency. So you should be able to count on things like Oh, there's no water. Well, the government's going to have a water truck here, but the deadline is 72 hours. So you have to be completely self-sufficient for that time. No electricity, same thing. Um, and other things to think about how to be in touch with your family, your friends, your office, whatever else you need to do and how to get information. So we're going to talk about all of those things a little bit today. Here's a fast fact. Most Canadians surveyed will say that emergency planning and an emergency kit are important, but only a very small number have the kit. I actually first started reading about this after the ice storm for obvious reasons. And um, I went out and built the kit, found this. This is the actually the 26th year that Canada has offered this information. But I was one of the first people to start broadcasting this around uh, at the school after the ice storm. And, um, and I created all of those kits, but then we moved a couple of years ago. And, you know, some of the stuff got lost in the move and uh, you forget about it. And so every once in a while, even if you've done this before, it's great to go back and refresh. So the three steps and the three parts of our talk today are, first of all, know what the risks are. Secondly, make a plan. And third, get an emergency kit together. Um, but I'm gonna talk about more than one emergency kit, although the Canadian government slides just talk about one particular thing. Um, Alex, if there are any questions yet, let me know, okay? If not, I'll keep going. All right, nope, so far so good, George. Okay, so common misconceptions. Most emergencies are short-lived. Well, yes, emergencies can be short-lived, but the effects can sometimes last for months. Um, I remember flying into LA for a meeting in 1994, about 10 days after they'd had a major Northridge earthquake. I got in a taxi and I headed into the city from LA International and I was stunned as we drove down the main freeway to see, um, we'd get to an intersection and the overpass from the other highway was just gone. There were just pieces of highways just disappeared in the, that 10 days they had cleaned them away, but it took them months to rebuild their highway system. Hurricane Juan in Nova Scotia, they're still living with the effects of, um, parts of Halifax were devastated. There's no vegetation now 17, 18 years later and so on. Um, Second concept, I won't ever have to deal with an emergency where I live. I hope to debunk that one for you in the next 15 minutes. 
Third, there are a lot of emergencies I just can't prepare for. No, there's lots of things you can do to be prepared, even though you can't know what might happen. And preparing takes too much time and effort. Well, I'm gonna say, no, it doesn't. Um, we'll, we'll come back to those points. So step one is know the risks and know your region uh, because the risks are different in different places. So we're gonna talk about that. Um, we're gonna learn a little bit about our area today, but the list of things that they can mention, blizzards, droughts, earthquakes, extreme cold and heat, floods, hurricanes, landslides, power outages, winter storms, um, fires, and so on. So what do you remember? Think for a minute, and think what local disasters do you remember happening in the last uh, five or 10 years? And then see if the ones that I'm gonna mention, see if you've thought of any of these. Um, I'll give you a hint. Think winter, think spring, think summer. Well, of course, the first tornado. one. We have a tornado in the golf course. There was one yes. in Candiac. Uh, yes. Earthquakes, uh, the ice storm. Yep. Well, the ice storm would have to be the first one. Um, it's one of the most expensive, if not the most expensive. I Actually, I think that there were two big floods out west, one in, in Winnipeg some years back and one in Calgary in the past decade. Um, one of those might have been more expensive than the ice storm, but not by much. 35 people died, 1,000 people were injured, and you know you lived it yourselves. Uh, how about remembering the Saguenay River Dam, which broke in July 1996? That was the first multi-billion dollar uh, event in Canada. It caused $3 billion worth of damage, and if you've been to Shakutami since then, <laughs> It just, I mean, there were literally streets gone, just no sign that a street had ever existed there. It was a remarkable event. Um, and then, um, I don't know if anybody thought of it, but in the springtime, of course, we do have some flooding. And in fact, we've had some almost historic flooding twice in the past uh, three, four years now, which I will come back to shortly. Um, here's a disaster that we might remember. This is, um, this was, uh, on the night of the 14th to 15th of March, 2017, at least 2,500 people got stuck on the Decary Expressway overnight. Many of them waited longer than 10 hours in their cars without being able to get out. Personally, I was thinking, man, I would have had to go to pee before that was over, but... <laughs> There's probably worse problems than that. Um, that same day, there was a, a large amount of flooding. There was a, a over 100 kilometer per hour winds. Um, and again, on uh, Friday, November the 1st, 2019, we had um, a rain and wind event here. Over 700,000 Quebec homes lost power that night, and we lost power for 36 hours two nights. It was out Friday night. It was out Saturday night. We actually went off to a hotel because um, it was just really, um, we didn't know how long the power was going to be off. Nobody could say. They just kept changing the estimates. It came back on Sunday afternoon. In Sherbrooke, 100 millimeters of rain caused the Saint-Francois River to rise 23 feet in a very short period of time and they had to evacuate all the homes in the area of the river. So yeah, we've had lots of local disasters here. Now I wanna play you another video. If I can just flip this one up here. Um, this one will give you a little slightly other different thing to remember. At least one person has died and several others are missing after a freight train carrying crude oil exploded into a giant fireball in a small Canadian town. The driverless train derailed and crashed into the streets of Lagmanatique, sending flames hundreds of feet into the air, engulfing cars and destroying up to 30 buildings. 
Around 1,000 people were evacuated from their homes, and local media said that between 40 and 80 people were still missing. Four of the 73 pressurized tanker cars blew up when the train came off the rails, sending locals scrambling for safety. It was raucous. It leaped. There were big balls of fire above the cafe. We jumped over the railing. We crossed the street, and just in the time it took to cross the street, the street was filled with fire. It was a river of fire. Huge clouds of thick black smoke were still rising from the Quebec province several hours after the disaster, and police fear that the death toll will rise. Yeah, did anybody think about that one? That was um, So let's talk about other kinds of local disasters. I've just shown you that. And train wrecks in Canada do happen. Montreal and the South Shore are both vulnerable to train wrecks, in fact. And um, even um, the West Island has got major train lines running all the way through it. Um, and these facilities are vulnerable to accidents like the one in Lac Megantic, but they're also, um, they're also vulnerable to vandalism, which means it could happen anytime. You know, there have been incidents of people who were angry for one reason or another. They find a train track, they drop, you know, a big chunk of metal or something onto the rail and they walk away. And the next time a train goes by, bang. And the thing about trains compared to a lot of other stuff is a lot of major facilities like um, water plants and stuff that we depend on, electric uh, stations, they're all heavily protected. But the train tracks, they cross our country in the wide open spaces and anybody can get at them. So for example, here's a map of St. Hubert and Brossard. And if you can, can you see my mouse, Alex? Can you see my mouse on the screen? Yes, we can. Okay, so yeah, the red line, the red line that I'm pointing at is a main rail line. It comes off the Victoria Bridge above the top of the screen. It comes down um, the center of St. Hubert and then turns and runs across Brossard. Uh, well, this is St. Hubert. It runs into the St. Hubert Industrial Park near Pei. And then it crosses Brossard right through the middle of the residential district all the way down to Chemin des Prairies here where the main line turns off to the right and goes to New York State. So what you're looking at here is the main line from Canada to the Northeastern US. And because of that, there are major freight trains as well as the Amtrak passenger trains before the pandemic, of course. Uh, major freight trains run across this line day and night. The other spur that goes down to the bottom left goes to where some of our other friends live in La Prairie and Candiac. So you can see the main line running off to the right here. The other line crosses through La Prairie, runs through the big industrial, there's a heavy industrial park in there that a lot of people are fed from the rail line here. And then it runs into, it goes under the highway at the Montcalm exit and runs into the Candiac industrial park. And long-term, um, Long-term Candiac residents know there's a couple of big chemical plants right there that receive deliveries by tanker car. So um, yeah, uh, train, train uh, problems could happen on the South Shore. And of course, all the way along Highway 20 through the West Island of Montreal, you've got the main lines running to all the rest of Canada going through there. And you've got big tanker trains running through there, chemicals. Um, one or two more little items just uh, for personal interest. Um, this is the corner of Newman and Labatt Street in LaSalle. It's right near the Mercier Bridge. And on the left, you see a Labatt Brewery, a Montreal Brewery. And on the right, you see the Budweiser uh, Water Tower, which you can see from all over LaSalle. And you can see it from the Mercier Bridge, particularly at night. What's interesting to me personally about this one is, um, uh, two of our children live within walking distance of this water tower. And um, up on the top of that water tower, there's a World War II air raid siren. I always thought that was a little weird because if you're my age, you can remember when you were young, we used to have air raid sirens all over Canada and they were tested every once in a while and you could hear them. 
So my son got a notice in the mail a couple of weeks ago saying um, that they're going to test that siren. Why do they have a siren on the water tower? Well, it turns out large food processing and beverage plants, they have chilling systems that run on ammonia. Because although you can use Freon and lots of other kinds of gas, ammonia is still the most efficient liquid gas to run a refrigeration plant. So it turns out that within a kilometer around this plant, there's a disaster planning zone that if any of the uh, refrigeration units should leak, uh, what will happen is that everybody, that siren will blare and everybody within a square kilometer of that plant will have to evacuate immediately. So that's LaSalle. But as I said, there are chemical plants in Candiac as well. Okay, so, uh, and this is just a quick one. I'm gonna jump out of this uh, disasters and onto planning in a minute, but I went and looked up, Canada has actually a disaster database that you can look up the biggest problems in Canada. So I looked up highest death toll in Canada and guess what, it's all pandemics. This, um, We've heard about the Spanish flu lately. It killed 55,000 people in Canada, apparently. HIV AIDS, we've all heard about. I didn't realize it was classed as a pandemic, but obviously it would be. 25,000 people have died so far. And uh, COVID-19, they're listing currently about 20,000 deaths and so on. In this list, basically we have a bunch of pandemics. We have one hurricane. We have an earthquake, a volcano eruption. I think the Halifax explosion, if you know that story, it devastated a large part of Halifax completely. A lot of people died instantly. And um, a couple of shipwrecks, including one that happened right off the island where my sister lives. Well, how about that? Okay, and then we have earthquakes. Very quickly, there are four Canadian cities that are susceptible. Ottawa's had the biggest quake uh, lately. They had a, a magnitude five earthquake in 2010, just north of Ottawa. And in the Gatineau, there were collapsed bridges, closed roads. We felt it in Montreal, but it didn't affect us. The most active earthquake zone in Eastern Canada is the Saguenay region. They had a magnitude six quake in 1988 that caused them 37 million in damages. And the biggest, uh, biggest earthquake that we've ever had in Canada was a gigantic magnitude 8.1. This is a disastrous quake that occurred in 1949 in BC in the Queen Charlotte Islands. And it's one of the largest that's been recorded in the world. And there was one in 1929, there was a quake in the ocean, in the Atlantic Ocean off the Grand Banks that caused a tsunami that hit Newfoundland, killed 27 people and wiped out villages. So um, yeah, yeah, we can do that. Then there are floods. This is my last section of the know the risks in your area. I just want to point out two things here. The Quebec government also has a large amount of disaster planning information out there. And um, much of it has to do with flooding because flooding is a constant problem in different parts of Quebec. So I'm, I've, and we'll send you this address. Um, there's an address where you can go for information about floods and real time information in when that's a problem. The Quebec government says is at the bottom of your screen there, it boils down to the same thing that the federal government says, pretty much, but with a couple of extra things. Make a plan and make a kit. It's exactly the same information you'd get from the federal government. Have a check valve. If you don't know that, um, prior to about 1965 or 70, um, the sewer pipe just left your house and poured into the street sewer. So if there was a flood and the sewer system started to back up, it would climb back up into your house, causing terrible damage, smelly. And um, so at some point in time, the Quebec uh, and Canada legislated that every new home built had to have a check valve in the outlet of the house. If you don't have one of those, it's really worth considering having it put in. A plumber can tell you. And the reason for that, one of the reasons for that is if you don't have a check valve, most home insurance policies will not cover you for damage against sewer backing up, which otherwise they would. The other thing to know about your home insurance is this. Until about 2012, uh, people used to think, oh, yeah, I've got, I've got flood coverage in my policy, but it was limited to things like uh, a pipe burst during the summer in your wall, 
or um, in some cases you had sewer backup coverage if you had that rider on your policy. But what was never covered until um, lately was what they call water over the ground. So in other words, you live by the river, the river rises like it does in Chateaugay every spring or up on the North shore. Um, you get flooded out. Guess what? Your home policy doesn't cover a thing. And all those people that you see on the television 2017 and 2019, a lot of them, their insurance company won't pay. That's why they had to go to the Quebec government and ask for disaster money. And the reason is that most home ownership policies anywhere in Canada didn't cover that kind of flooding, water crawling across the ground to your house. However, in, uh, in 2011, 2012, we had very bad floods in the central part of Quebec, in places like um, Drummondville and uh, Nicolette out there. And uh, the insurance industry did a study after that, and they realized, the government did a study with them, and, real, and they realized that this was a major problem, recurring problem. We needed to have some kind of coverage. So most home ownership policies were rewritten after that to include optional flood protection. The cost of it depends on where your house is located. If you're anywhere near a floodplain, it'll be much higher, but you can get it. And nowadays, if you have home ownership insurance, you need to check your policy with your broker and make sure that you have the coverage for that flood, particularly if you're in one of those zones. And where would those zones be? Well. Here's a map of the Montreal area. The purple is the flood zones. Um, you'll notice that uh, the river between Laval and Montreal Islands, the Rivière des Prairies, uh, is a major flood area. There's um, the Ottawa River up towards um, Ontario. There's the Richelieu River, which is a major flood territory. Uh, out around Repontigny, there's some zones that are quite uh, vulnerable. And on the South Shore, um, Chateaugay, let's look at the South Shore a little more closely, first of all. So there's Candiac. Um, you'll see that along all the rivers running through the Roussillon territory, there are floodplains adjacent to the rivers. So if you're in one of those areas, then you need to check your homeownership insurance particularly well. Um, if you're in Brossard or La Prairie, this is the Saint-Jacques River that um, is the boundary of Brossard and La Prairie. And there's a very wide flood zone around that because the land's quite flat near that river and it's very small. It would be easy for that to flood. Interestingly enough, our youngest child has a condo right at the very top of that zone. <laughs> um, and now about this big pink thing here, what you're looking at on the map, uh, Il Perot is in the center there, and that's Lake St. Louis. Um, and if I move my mouse over here to the bottom corner, right there where my mouse is jumping around, that's the Beauharnois power plant uh, at Beauharnois, Quebec. And right behind that is a 10 story high, um, 20 kilometer long reservoir of water. If anything should ever happen to that dam, that entire pink area would be swamped within minutes. So that includes the shoreline all the way from Beauharnois to Kanawaki and, and a big chunk of, uh, right there where my mouse is, a big chunk of Chateaugay would be immediately inundated within minutes. All of the shoreline of Il Perot a piece of uh, Vaudreuil Dorion, a piece, the, the town of Pointe des Cascades, and a little piece of Saint Anne de Bellevue, including some condos, which they unwisely built right in the middle of the Ritter there, would be um, instantly in serious trouble. And so, um, yes, we can have floods. Yes, indeed, we can have floods. So I'll just jump back from there for a second to give you a, a little change of pace and say, Hey, how about that? Does anybody have any questions now that I've, I've talked about risk? I've talked about the risks that occur in our area. There's um, train crashes, there's floods, there's power outages, there's the ice storm, there's um, a lot of possibilities. Anybody have any questions about any of that? Going once, going twice? Not, if, I will you, if you do want to ask a question, we because we are a small group, I think it'd be okay if you can unmute yourself. I don't see any questions yeah. in the in the chat, but if you have a okay. question, go for it. 
Okay. So I will Hi, keep. Flynn. Hi. I've been living in La Prairie for, well, since 1975. Has the Saint Jacques River ever came out of its bed? Uh, I've been in and out of Brossard since 1985. And um, there's been minor flooding, but there's never been anything major that I know of that's uh, actually damaged any homes. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so they suggest, first of all, you should know what the risks might be in your area. And I think, as I say, we've all seen some of it. Second thing then is to make a plan. And there are a number of things you can plan for. So let me just uh, go back and share my screen again here so you can see some of this information with me. There is a guide that mentions on this slide, the emergency preparedness guide. We're gonna send you that, it's a PDF. And um, it lists a number of things that you, forms that you can fill out um, to uh, prepare parts of your plan. And I'll also send you a link if you're, um, if you're the kind uh, person who's used to working on screen instead of on paper, we have a, a virgin, um, a version sorry, a version of um, the plan, which is um, available on um, a website from the federal government. And we can send you the link, you can fill it out there and have an e-copy. Okay, so here's a, here's a scenario that um, that uh, maybe I'll start by playing you a piece of video right here. By definition, emergencies happen when we don't expect them and often when families are not together. Suddenly, you need to think about your kids at school or elderly parents across town. If phones don't work or some neighborhoods aren't accessible, what will you do? The best way to help ensure your family's safety in these situations is to have an emergency plan. Having a plan and discussing it with loved ones will save time and make real situations less stressful. To get started, let's look at one of three scenarios. In our first scenario, you and your family are separated. In an emergency, you'll need a simple way to contact and meet one another if going home isn't possible. Decide in advance on a safe place to meet like a community center, library, or school. The phone can help too. Long distance calls may work better than local ones, so select a couple of out-of-town contacts who can help your family communicate and find each other. Let them know about your plan and how they can help. Of course, children are a big concern. If they're in school or daycare, they will need to be picked up. Know the school and daycare's emergency policies, and if you can't pick up the kids, designate someone who can and talk to your kids about your family emergency plan. Teach them basic personal information so they can identify themselves if they become separated from you and who to call, like 911 or your local emergency number, to get help. In our second scenario, you're together at home. In this case, listen to the radio or television for information from local authorities and follow their instructions. They may advise to turn utilities off or on, so it's important to know the location of your home's water valve, electrical panel, gas valve, and floor drain. Make sure everyone also knows the location of your family emergency kit and fire extinguisher. In our third scenario, you have to evacuate. Everyone should know your home's safe exits and best places to go. And remember your pets, who may not be allowed in shelters or hotels. Identify kennels or friends' homes where they can go in an emergency. Elderly family members or those with disabilities or special needs should also be a part of your plan. List the medications and supplies they may need in the event of an evacuation and any information caregivers will require. If they live alone, ask a friend or neighbor to check in on them or help them evacuate. In addition to your plan, documents will help you stay organized. Make copies of birth certificates, passports, wills, and insurance info. 
These documents, along with photos of your family members, should be kept at work or other safe locations. Having a plan is also part of being a responsible community member. Local authorities will react swiftly, but they can't reach everyone at once. Being prepared allows these responders to help those in urgent need first. So, do your part. Learn about the emergencies that can happen where you live and plan for situations that are more likely to occur. Take 20 minutes today and create your family emergency plan. Get started at getprepared.ca. Okay, so um, now if here I am again, I think. Um, so if we were able to be together, if it wasn't for the pandemic, I would now hand you out a copy of the emergency preparedness guide and give a little time for you to look over the lists. That video that I just showed you lists a very large amount of information in a very short space of time and all of it's important. So, like I said, we're gonna send you all a copy of that guide and you'll be able to sit and look at those checklists and lists of things to do and prepare on your own. But I'm gonna cover, I'm gonna to touch on some of the important things in the next uh, few minutes. Back to the slides here. So, there we are. So they talked about um, recognizing all the emergency exits from your home. Uh, we did this exercise after the ice storm and it was kind of uh, depressing because it was like, okay, there's only one way out of all the bedrooms. <laughs> there's only one way out of the laundry room. What do they mean have uh, exits? And so, um, but in the end, um, after talking with uh, other people who were doing it too, some people actually uh, a couple of people I know went so far as to actually get a ladder that they could put up against the back of their house, um, a rope ladder kind of thing that you throw over the window to get out. I didn't go that far, I confess. But the important thing about emergency exits is to think about where could a fire start in your house and make sure that you know how you would get out if there was a fire in the kitchen, if there was a fire in the fireplace, which was blocking your front entrance, say, and you couldn't go out the front door, and to make sure that you keep those things clear. So in the, in the wintertime, for example, um, one thing that the fire people will all recommend to you is um, make sure that you shovel your back steps into your backyard, because if you can't get out your front door and there's a fire, you will need to get quickly out and safely out of your house somewhere and the fire department will need to get in. They mentioned designating a family area, a meeting area, it's away from your home because if your home has been blocked off for some reason, like a, a train wreck and you can't get near that and you need to have agreed in advance. They mentioned that the phones will go down. This is a real thing. Um, I was teaching at Dawson College when the Dawson shooting happened in 2006. The cellular phone system went down within minutes it just stopped. And the reason was it was overloaded. Everybody picked up their phone and started trying to call. And the thing that they said in the video is true. Uh, what happens is the local circuits go down, but sometimes a long distance circuit will still be in place because they're not being used by most of the calls. So it is a real thing that if a real disaster happens, you may or may not be able to count on your, um, your cell phone to communicate. So you should have a pre-planned, um, you should also know how to get out of your neighborhood. And, and of course, you and I, if we drive a car, we already know pretty much how to, how to get in and out of our neighborhood, but maybe our children don't. Maybe that's something that um, we could discuss with them. People with disabilities, if you have a mobility issue and um, you think that you might not be able to easily get out in under disaster conditions, then um, at least in some of our municipalities, I know that the fire department actually keeps a record of people with mobility issues. And there is a form that you can fill out. Um, I know that in Long Gale, including Brossard, that there is a form that you can fill out and you register with the fire department. And if there is a disaster, they will come to your house. 
they will, and if there's a fire in your neighborhood, they will know that they have somebody they have to look out for and act on it. So that's a good thing to know and keep track of. Don't do this. <laughs> uh, I have to confess, this is my next door neighbor. And um, underneath the, those piles of snow, there's a couple inches of ice that's been formed by melting and thawing all winter. If somebody had to get down those steps in an emergency, they might just kill themselves before they got off the steps. So always keep those shoveled. Um, and speaking of fire, let me briefly mention, fire safety is really a separate talk, not much for today, but besides the exits and the other thing they mentioned, you need to know where the shutoffs are for water, gas, and electricity, because if there's some kind of disaster that affects the municipal infrastructure, uh, you need to know that if you don't shut off the water, gas, and electricity before you leave, your house insurance may not cover any damage that takes place. So that's quite important to do. And if you don't know where those shutoffs are and how to use them, uh, then the family should get together or you should get together with uh, somebody who knows and find them. And fire extinguishers are important. So here are two fire extinguishers that we actually have in our house. Uh, for most people, it's probably enough to have the little kitchen size fire extinguisher, which you see on the left. There's three different kinds of fire extinguishers, type A, type B, and type C. Uh, some extinguishers will do all three, some will only do one or two. So the one on the left is labeled 5BC. The number is uh, how big of a fire it can handle. It's uh, just a relative scale. So, and you can see that little fire extinguisher mounted on the side of one of my kitchen cabinets there on the right hand side of the picture. So it's easily accessible from the kitchen and also as it happens, it's right next to the patio door where the barbecue is outside. So we could use that if we had a barbecue fire, a kitchen fire and the 5BC is the best type to deal with kitchen fires. You have to be very careful with kitchen fires because you should never spray any kind of thing on burning oil. If you have a burning oil fire, um, the wrong kind of fire extinguisher will actually accelerate the fire really, really quickly and you will have a tornado of fire before you know it. And uh, so if you have a burning oil fire, what you do is you smother it somehow. Put a lid on the pot or uh, drop something uh, inflammable over the top of it like a big plate or something, whatever you can do to cut the oxygen. But you only do any of that after you've called 911 and then you run. The one on the right is a bigger multi-purpose fire extinguisher and we have that one because we have a fireplace and we use it and we prepared to use it in times of uh, power outages. We have used it, <laughs> we have used it repeatedly. And uh, so that one is big enough to handle um, the fireplace and also anything that might go wrong like in the garage or in the, with an appliance in the backyard, whatever. Um, the little kitchen fire extinguishers run for 25 to 30 bucks. There's two kinds. There's the um, disposable ones. It'll say jetable or, or disposable or single use on, and you can only use them once they cannot be refilled. Um, they're good for 10 to 12 years and then you have to um, empty them and throw the empty thing in the garbage. The one on the right is a rechargeable one. A lot of the better fire extinguishers can be recharged, but it has to be done by a professional. Sometimes your fire department can do it for you. Um, they have to be tested every six years and they have to be recharged every 10 or 12 years as well. And uh, that one there went for about $75. Uh, if you have school children, you should have a clear idea of what your school's emergency policy is. They should have informed you in advance what's going to happen. Um, I know myself and Edith also has mentioned that um, from her school, they have, um, uh, if they have a big disaster, they're supposed to walk across, uh, walk one block down and gather in the school that's one block over, right, Edith? Not if you're, yes, yeah, something like that, eh? And uh, at Dawson College, we had instructions. So, sorry to cut you off. Go ahead. Yes, every school has um, a plan to partner up with some other school. 
Royal Oak had a plan, and I know Jubilee uh, GPI has a plan. So right. They will be. So they get moved. The students will actually get moved to a different school. Yes. And so the parents need to know. And actually, if you're a grandparent and you're the alternate pickup person for your grandchildren, you need to know uh, where those kids would be if there was a disaster. Your school should tell you. And George, also to add in, it's also important in the case of a lockdown, especially with many of our high schools, you know, as you stated before, the cell networks get overwhelmed when, you know, people are in a panic and if there's a lockdown and things like that. So parents knowing what the protocols are, where to look for the most important and up-to-date information is crucial and to discuss it with the kids too, because these are unfortunately some new realities we're all facing. Yep, totally. We actually did have a lockdown at... Um... Heritage High School, didn't we last year? This year as well. As this year, the board offices also got locked down, and um, you know, it's it's an interesting situation. I was one of the people who got locked down, and it was huh. uh, a very interesting situation. And you kind of realize how unprepared sometimes you are in those emergency situations. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. So it's good to think about this stuff in advance. And that's for sure. Things, one of the things that I know happened at or at the other school that I was at um, was a, a lockdown bucket. And in that bucket, it was a bucket for emergencies, like uh, human- um, All kinds of emergencies. <laughs> but within that bucket, there was water and uh, granola bars and blankets and sanitation paper and Supplies. and all kinds of things that that you needed in case you were there like more than 40 minutes if you're there overnight and you need the bucket so that is in place but the kids need to be aware and the parents need to be aware that that's there and available yep what, and what might be happening that's right so if you've got children in the family these are all things to be thinking about um, special needs so some people have health needs and as we get older sometimes we have more health needs and so um, they suggest that you should have a grab and go bag ready with um, the things that you might need on a moment's notice if you suddenly had to evacuate and um, yeah for some of us things like a walker having those things handy to where you can get them out the door quickly uh, would be important uh, I'll keep moving along. Oh, high rises. There are some of us who are living in condos and um, it's important to know uh, how to get out of the condo. It's important to know what, what, what staircases you can use and whether or not the elevator is gonna work. Some, some have emergency power, some don't. Um, it's also good to know that if the water, uh, if the power goes out, is my water going to work? Because in buildings that are higher than 10 stories, usually the water is, is pumped in by electric pumps. And so in a high rise condo, when the power goes off, you may or may not have water. Uh, pets, uh, to make sure that you will have a place to put your pet because a lot of the shelters won't take them and that you will have, if you have a pet, some food and water in the kit for them too. And as was mentioned in the video, um, you should have an out of town contact person, you know, a brother or a sister who doesn't live quite in the same area or if another relative that you could set up with uh, to be a central contact for your family. If, if you can't reach mom and you can't reach dad, call uncle Peter or call auntie Vicky, that kind of thing, you know, set that up in advance. Okay, here's a few other points quickly from the video. Any health information that somebody else would need to know about you if you were incapacitated? Like, who's your doctor? What medications are you on? Uh, do you have any allergies? Um, 
and uh, contact numbers for things like that that you might need to know. That's important to have written down. And if you're living alone, keep it in an obvious accessible place so that people can grab it if they have to come and grab you. <laughs> um, inform the fire department if you have mobility issues I mentioned and keep your contact list with you. Um, so don't forget if you're keeping all your contacts and stuff in your telephone, you gotta keep your telephone going. Which brings me to another thing, prepare a kit that could last. So what would you put? The basic emergency kit, according to um, Public Safety Canada, um, I have a little video for you here. Let me bring this up. No, no, no not, not the right video. Uh, sorry. Wait a minute. We live in a world that's unpredictable. Without warning, we may have to make quick decisions that impact the health and safety of our loved ones. It's easy to assume that we'll be able to gather what we need when something unexpected happens, but few of us really know what will make the difference. This is preparing a family emergency kit in plain English. Imagine that your neighborhood begins to flood in the middle of the night. You may have to leave your home quickly or wait until local authorities tell you where and when it's safe to go. In either situation, you want to be able to take care of your family for at least 72 hours while emergency workers help those in urgent need. Having a well-stocked, portable, and easy-to-find emergency kit will help make sure that you have the basic supplies to keep you and your family safe, no matter where you are. Let's talk about what goes into that kit. In an emergency, the basic services we use every day may not work. For example, your water, electricity, Gas and telephone service may not work, and it may be impossible to access cash from a bank. When these services are not available, an emergency kit can provide the basic necessities. For example, we all need water. The rule of thumb is 2 liters per person per day for 72 hours, or 3 days. It's a good idea to use small bottles that can be carried easily. Of course, we also need food. Because your kit needs to be ready at all times, Use food that won't spoil, like canned goods, energy bars, or dried food that can be stored longer. If needed, baby formula and pet food may be a good idea. And remember a manual can opener to open those cans. So now your kit has a good start, food and water. What else? Well, it's dark and there's no electricity. A flashlight and radio will be handy to see where you're going and help you stay informed. These both need power, so pack extra batteries or even better, buy the type that can be powered manually with a crank. Cordless phones don't work when there's no electricity. Consider including a phone with a cord, too. Of course, an emergency kit wouldn't be complete without a first aid kit with the basics like bandages, antiseptic, and pain relievers. With these items, food and water, flashlight and radio, and a first aid kit, we've covered the basics. But there are some items that may not be so obvious. For example, it may be very difficult to get prescription medications in an emergency or even long afterward. Including a couple of weeks worth of medication in the kit will help. While you're thinking about medical needs, consider what equipment may be needed to accommodate family members with special needs. As we mentioned, it may be difficult to get cash from banks, so include small bills and change as cash registers may not work. Lastly, keeping important documents like copies of birth certificates, wills, passports, and insurance policies in your kit can make it easier to stay organized during an emergency. Remember to include a copy of your emergency plan and contact information for friends and family who may be able to help. We all hope that emergencies don't occur and your kit goes unused, but that's no reason to delay. It's your responsibility to start gathering supplies and thinking about what your family will need for at least 72 hours in an emergency. It may look like a lot to do, but you can print an emergency kit checklist, and the next time you're running errands, pick up a few items for your kit, or buy a prepackaged one. Having an emergency kit is an easy way to have more peace of mind in an unpredictable world. For more information, visit getprepared.ca. Okay, so um, uh, Alex, do we have any questions floating at this point? We do not have any questions floating okay. at this point. Good. Well, then I will zip through a few points with respect to stocking up. 
first thing is uh, there's a lot of stuff you can get if you want to be really prepared. But just like the guy said, my experience is you don't have to spend a lot of money all at once. You can make a list of things and just over a period of months, actually, in our case, it's been over a period of years. We've gradually connected all kinds of uh, stuff together that we would need to be totally self-sufficient. It's not hard. Um, so let me try to move on here. There's some things. Uh, they mentioned crank radio. I don't know if everybody knows this, but um, there are radios that you can buy, uh, not that expensive. Um, you crank it for say three or four minutes, and then it has enough power to play for an hour. Then you crank it again. Same with flashlights. You can get flashlights that you crank it up for a couple of minutes and then it'll work for half an hour and you don't need batteries at all. That's cool. But um, for the rest of us, I, <laughs> I'm known for having a box of all kinds of batteries in my garage and keeping it stocked so that I'm never without the batteries I need. Um, one thing that they didn't mention in the video, so I'm going to mention it here and I'm going to send you this list. It's also very important to have an emergency kit in your car. For example, those people who were stuck on the Decary Expressway overnight in a snowstorm. Um, this is a long list. I won't go through all of it, but there's some obvious things in here and a few that are not so obvious. Um, keeping a couple, I've kept uh, some sesame bars and things like that in my glove compartment for years. And every once in a while it comes in handy. Uh, flares for if you break down on the road um, and other things that are quite important. I would urge everybody to study this. If you're a CAA member, the CAA um, has lists like this as well, but you can get this one from us. Um, in addition to the basic list of things they mentioned, there is also a federal government list of additional possible items, and I've put it in the slides. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it right now, but again, you're going to get this list. So you can look at this change of clothing for each household member. Um, if you get some of those little tiny solar blankets that you can stick in a bag so that you can wrap yourselves up if you have to sleep in your car for some reason or whatever. Um, you can buy first aid kits from St. John Ambulance and, and the Canadian Red Cross. And um, you definitely should have first aid supplies amongst those things as well. Uh, here's one that people might not think of right away. If you have a longer water outage, uh, after the fact of trying to drink some and maybe having a little extra for cooking, you're gonna need to flush your toilet. So I have, um, it's actually a gas container that you would use for a lawnmower or um, uh, a boat engine. And uh, I just keep it empty on the shelf. But since most of us live not too far from water, if you really need to flush your toilet, you can take this container down and just hold it into, under the edge of the river and then take it back and pour it into your tank. Bingo, your problem is solved may seem like a weird thing to think about, but believe me, when you have that water failure, you're gonna love this. And now um, my last major topic, and I think it's the most important, we're almost done now, but this is a really important one. And it's not obvious, contacting your family members and getting information about what's going on. Um, and when the power goes out, um, obviously your chargers stop working, your computer may suddenly go blank and uh, your TV won't work and anything else that's plugged into the grid is gone. In addition to that, your internet may well go down. And if your internet goes down, you aren't gonna get any information on your web browser or on your telephone or anywhere else. And nowadays, many of us depend on this. So I wanna talk about that for a few minutes. The key thing is to keep your devices running. And I learned these lessons very quickly during the ice storm. But um, since I, um, been in engineering and computer systems for much of my life. Uh, it was kind of second nature for me to make these preparations. So let me share a few things with you. Um, the telephone system, your telephone may still be charged and running, but the telephone system around you may go down. First of all, the bell system, uh, in every town, there's a little central office building and 
in the basement of those buildings, it's just wall to wall, floor to ceiling batteries, big car batteries. They look like truck batteries. And the, the way the telephone system works is if the power goes off, every building has got batteries to run the whole telephone building for 48 hours. After 48 hours, those buildings have to have a generator running or they will fail. When the ice storm started, I was walking down Rome Boulevard uh, or driving down, I forget, within a couple of days of the ice storm. And all of a sudden at all those little telephone boxes that are here and there in the neighborhood, you'd see a bell truck, you'd see a generator sitting in a snowbank, you'd see a cable going into the little bell box and you'd see a bell guy sitting in the truck doing nothing, watching that the generator wasn't gonna be stolen. <laughs> and um, so, it's all, all the infrastructure is susceptible when you lose power. So here's a few things that I did. Um, the first thing you may well know about this, you can buy these little rechargeable batteries in the computer stores, the dollar store, the staples, camera stores. You can charge these things up on your computer or your phone charger. And then when your phone goes dead, you can just plug it into this cable here and it'll run your phone for another day or two. You can recharge that. This little one at the bottom here is made specifically for iPhones and it just pops right onto the bottom of the iPhone and will run it for another day or two until you recharge it. It's good to have one of those around and you can carry them in a pocket or a purse or a briefcase. Um, and they run 15 to $30. I just stumbled across this when I was preparing this talk. You can now get those little chargeable batteries with a solar panel on them. So, hey, you don't even need the power to recharge your telephone now. You can put this in the sun. And once you charge it up uh, for some hours, it'll charge up to six phones for about 35 bucks on Amazon right now. I'm going to be buying one of those real soon. Um, another thing I invested in, and it was really useful in the ice storm, is a charger that runs in your car. So I was able to go out and start the car for an hour every day and charge up the telephones and, and other things, which I'll come to in a second. This particular one, I paid a little more for it, but it's got an extra high power, so it charges very fast. The telephone can charge in like less than an hour, full charge from dead. And it's got a USB jack there on the left-hand side, so you can plug in a second wire. You can actually charge two phones at a time with this charger. And you can charge any kind of phone. You know, sometimes they'll sell you one that only works for your phone. This one will charge any phone. I keep that in the car at all times. Um, I keep this in the car too sometimes. So this is uh, called an inverter. And um, I used to take this uh, on camping trips so that I could bring my laptop with me and um, plug it in when I needed to run it. Um, it plugs into your cigarette lighter and it gives you a 120 volt outlet. Um, some new cars have that, but most don't. And this box cost, uh, nowadays you can buy them for $50 up to, you can, if you wanna get a big one that'll run like a kettle, it'll cost you two or 300 bucks. But this one is enough to run a computer, a television. And when the ice storm started, what I did was I took this thing out and plugged it into the car I ran an extension cord back into the basement and I plugged in my TV and I was able to watch the six o'clock news on the TV every night throughout the ice storm. I was the only one in my family who could. So everybody was phoning me to say, did you hear where the water is gonna be available or where the, where the firewood is gonna be available and stuff like that. This is a great little gadget. And this one I would strongly recommend if you, um, this is what they call a, a UPS, an uninterruptible power supply. Basically a box with batteries inside it and it's got USB outlets and it's got AC outlets on the top. And this one lives underneath my desk in the basement. And what's plugged into this is my internet router, my internet modem and the base station for our wireless phone system. So with this little box, when the power goes off here, we don't lose the internet. We don't lose our telephones. They're all over the house and they continue to work because they're all battery powered, but the base station needs to have current. And we don't lose our um, cable TV. So um, 
we can, I need to have another one on the television, but I can also watch it on a monitor that's hooked up to this thing. So this little box will run the internet for between 12 and 24 hours. And so for virtually any short to medium term power failure, we're all set. And in today's day where everything is being broadcast over the internet, you know, like municipalities, when there's a problem, boil water advisory, whatever, they send you a text message, they send you an email, or they post it through their app. And um, if your internet isn't working at home, you're not gonna get any of that stuff, even if your phone is charged and running, unless you have a little gadget like this. So this is a great investment. This was um, $79.99. Uh, and I will warn you, you can get other ones that are cheaper, but um, I bought a cheaper one. It was 10 or 15 bucks cheaper, but it had this really annoying feature that when the power went off, it beeps to wake the dead continually. So when you get these little run of the mill power failures in the middle of the night for a few minutes, everybody gets woken up. So I would highly recommend you spend the money for a good one that um, doesn't do nasty things like that. And that's why I recommend this particular unit over some of the others. George, we have a question of what this specific unit is called again. So it's called a UPS or uninterruptible power supply. Thank you. When I send out the notes, I will make sure to put the brand name and model name of these things. And, and you can buy these at computer stores. Um, you can buy them at Staples. Those Staples may be a little bit more expensive. And you can buy them at Costco. Different. Some of these models are available at Costco too. Um, what to know about them is that inside them, they have a small lead acid battery, a sealed battery, uh, which needs to be changed about every five years. And that's another reason to buy a reputable brand because you can, if you buy something that comes from who knows where, um, you may or may not be able to get a replacement battery for it when the battery stops holding a charge. So I'll uh, put that information in. So there's so much more that we could say, but I think um, I think we've covered uh, the the basics. Three steps to getting prepared: know the risks in your area, write down the data that you're going to need, make plans, uh, share them with your family members, especially the stuff about being in contact and where to meet up if you have to, and um, prepare a few kits. Prepare the basic uh, existence kit. Prepare the emergency car kit prepare some medical information and supplies, and um, plan for communications. Make sure you know how you're going to charge your phones, how you're going to have your keep your internet running, and um, hey, you'll be sitting in front of your fireplace laughing while the rest of the world freaks out. Let me see if I stop this. Did I have another slide? Oh, there are, I will include some addresses here. Um, there are some places you can go to look for some of the information that we have. I'm gonna put more links on the end of this presentation. There again is the, um, oh, and here's a nice thing for you Anglophones out there. Um, if you go to the uh, Quebec uh, Public Security Ministry website, there is no English button anywhere. Like so much of the government of Quebec, you cannot find an English web page. I did a little more searching and guess what? It turns out they do have a whole English website, but there's absolutely no mention of it on the French site or on the government index. So you need this particular little link here in order to find the English pages. It'll be in the handout as well. And that's, uh, I think I've said it all. So um, if there are any other questions, I'd be happy to take questions now. Can you see me? And for this part, if you have a burning question, please feel free to unmute yourself. Um, George, I don't have any questions in the question or in the chat, but uh, I would like to say thank you very much. That was a lot of great information. Um, it kind of makes you think about moving forward. Um, so it was a lot of great information that I think all of us can use and share with our family members. And it was very timely. So thank you very much. Well, Alex, you're you're right. welcome. You're all welcome. Um, yeah, I realize there's a, a lot of information packed in there, um, maybe more than you wanted to know all in one shot. 
but um, I, I agree it's it's worth digesting and uh, we'll make sure that we get a copy of all this out to everybody and um, we've recorded this presentation so hopefully anybody else who wants to see it later I guess Alex will probably put it up on the parish uh, YouTube channel or something absolutely I can I can assist with the technology side of that if you want Excellent. I will hold you to it, George. Okay. Stop the recording right. now in case anybody wants to uh, unmute themselves and things like that. So give okay. me two seconds.